All right, welcome to the lecture for Friday that April or yeah, Friday, April 3. <clears throat> this is going to be a big change of pace. We're moving away from optics into relativity. Now, we'll come back to some optics ideas later, that is the particle nature of light, but relativity is a big deal as you probably know. So, let's just get right on into it reference frames. Relativity is at its core relating, hence the word relativity, motion in one reference frame to motion in another reference frame. So, you know, we have a lot of experience with this. Galileo did a lot of work with relativity. And so I just have a little question here. Suppose two people walk hand in hand on a moving sidewalk in an airport. They might walk at 1.3 meters per second with respect to to a reference frame attached to the moving sidewalk. So you have, here's the moving sidewalk that's moving at the sidewalk with respect to the earth. And the moving sidewalk has a speed of 2.4 meters per second. And then you have our people here, two of them walking hand in hand who are traveling at a speed of the people with respect to the sidewalk of 1.3 meters per second. Now this is a seemingly obvious question. How fast are the people moving with respect to the earth? Well, typical thing you'd say is, well, they're moving 1.3 meters per second with respect to the sidewalk and the sidewalk's moving 2.4 meters per second with respect to the earth. So you have the velocity of the person with respect to the earth is the velocity of the person with respect to the sidewalk plus the velocity of the sidewalk with respect to the earth. And you'd be absolutely right. Now I want you to note these two inner indices are the same indices. And the two outer indices are the same as the ones we were looking for. So in determining the speed of the person with respect to the earth, we just take <clears throat> the velocity of the first index person with respect to some intermediary plus the speed of that intermediary with respect or velocity with respect to the earth, the second index, and we've got it. It's pretty simple. And so if you put in the numbers, of course, person with respect to sidewalk, that's 1.3 meters per second plus sidewalk with respect to earth, 2.4 meters per second. And you have... 3.7 meters per second. Pretty simple. That's relativity. Now, relativity gets harder, but that's what it's about. Now we have to introduce an idea of an inertial reference frame. Inertial reference frames means that the law of inertia, also known as Newton's first law, applies. And at this point, you may squint a little and say, are you kidding me? We learned Newton's first law. I thought it always applied. Well, it applies in only certain reference frames, in reference frames that are not accelerating. So if you're, if you are um, stationary, then you will not, <laughs> not accelerate unless a force acts on you. If you're in a car that's moving at constant velocity, it's not accelerating. And so you won't change your motion unless a force acts on you. But if you consider like being on a merry-go-round, if you're on a merry-go-round and you're rotating at a constant rate, you will fly off of that merry-go-round with no force acting on you. Why? Well, your merry-go reference frame was accelerating you constantly had to accelerate toward the center with an acceleration we call the centripetal acceleration to stay going around in a circle. So that was an accelerating reference frame. It was non-inertial. So non-inertial reference frames are reference frames that are accelerating. Another simple example might be you're in a car and you leave a stoplight and you get pushed back in your seat. Why do you push back in the seat? There's no force pushing you back. But what's happening is the car is accelerating forward 
And that's the reason for it. So the difference in inertial reference frames is important, inertial versus non-inertial. It's important when we get to talking about relativity. So here's an example with a merry-go-round that helps us to understand a little more about inertial and non-inertial reference frames. So if you are in a merry-go-round and you have somebody on the opposite side of the merry-go-round from you, you say, hey, throw me a ball, and they throw the ball directly at you, so that's the direction of the velocity initial. In reality, it's going to miss you. Why is it going to miss you? Well, there's two things at play here. Number one is that velocity initials like that, according to him, but keep in mind, his hand was moving that way when he threw it. And so when it left his hand, it actually had a sideways velocity along with the velocity going across, and he didn't even recognize that sideways velocity. Second of all, you're moving like this. So if he compensated for that sideways velocity, which most of us can do, we do it automatically, and so he really does throw it with the direction that's shown, throws it directly at you, compensating for that sideways motion, you still moved out of the way. So you moved away from it, if you had a camera, so this is an overhead camera, it shows him throwing the ball from here, and the ball just travels in a straight line, but the person trying to catch it moved out of the way. That's what really happened the way we describe it in an inertial reference frame. But these two people on the merry-go-round see themselves as stationary, and so they have their own reference frame of being on the merry-go-round, and they see that the ball curved away. So we have the difference there between an inertial and a non-inertial reference frame kind of clearly explained in my opinion. Now a question for you to answer, which of the following is an inertial reference frame? And you're supposed to answer all that are correct. So we have a stationary car, a car traveling at a constant velocity, a car accelerating along a straight road, a car going around a curve at a constant speed. Hopefully, as I was reading these, you came up with your answers. But remember, inertial means non-accelerating. So a stationary car. Is a stationary car accelerating? No. So that makes it inertial. A car traveling at a constant velocity. Remember, acceleration is the rate at which velocity is changing. So if it has a constant velocity, then the acceleration is zero, and that makes it inertial. Now, car accelerating, well, it says accelerating. That makes it non or makes it non-inertial, yeah. And a car going around a curve, if you go around a curve, as I just described, you're going like this, and you need a constant acceleration toward the center. So that's accelerating. It's non-inertial. So the two inertial reference frames were a stationary car and a car traveling at a constant velocity in that question. Now, you might say, wait a minute, the earth, if I'm on the surface of the earth, I'm accelerating. I mean, unless you're a flat earther. And the answer is yes, we are accelerating. When you're on the surface of the earth, <laughs> I don't know why I did that. When you're on the surface of the earth, the earth is rotating. And because it's rotating, you have a certain acceleration that you're constantly undergoing. And, I mean, you can calculate that. The acceleration is omega squared r, and omega is equal to 2 pi radians per day. And r is equal to, why well, I don't remember the radius of the air, something like 6,700 kilometers. So turn that into meters. And so we can put those in. Of course, you want to change days to seconds. And you can calculate the acceleration you're undergoing as you stay stationary on the surface of the earth. But because a day is a whole lot of seconds, one day is equal to, I'm actually going to check the race of the earth and do this calculation. I don't know why I didn't do it beforehand, I just didn't think about it. So the radius of the earth, just to be correct, is 
6,371. Okay, so it was 371. Um, 6,371,000 meters. So that's the radius. In one day is one day is eight six four zero zero seconds. So if we put those numbers in, that times the radius. I'm going to make life easier and put it in scientific notation. What we get for the centripetal acceleration of the Earth is sorry, I'm doing my calculation now. As you can hear from the dings, I made a mistake. It's Two pi divided by eight six four zero zero quantity squared times six three seven one one two three and that's equal to zero point zero three three six nine that's enough digits meters per second squared. So is that acceleration? Absolutely. So that means that the acceleration of gravity we feel is actually this much of the acceleration of gravity is going into supplying the necessary centripetal acceleration and the, the rest of it is what we feel. That's close enough to zero that for most things we do, we just say, yeah, the Earth is inertial. But the reality is it's not inertial. And we can see that in things like, you know, the hurricanes, trade winds, things that result from the Coriolis effect. So now we get to postulates of relativity, the actual postulates. So any reference frame that moves with a constant velocity with respect to inertial reference frame is itself inertial. So this is, this is still dealing with inertial reference frames. I guess we're not to the postulates yet. If one reference frame is inertial, another one has a constant velocity with respect to it. That is, if it's not accelerating with respect to the first one, since the first one wasn't accelerating and the second one's got a constant velocity with respect to it, it's also not accelerating, so it's inertial. It's pretty much an obvious statement. Um, so in the example with the person on the sidewalk, the sidewalk was moving at a constant rate. The person was moving at a constant rate. They were both inertial. So now another question. A bus is traveling at 20 meters per second with a and a student walks toward the front of the bus at 2 meters per second. So here we have the bus. Speed of the bus with respect to the earth is 20 meters per second. And then we have the student. The speed of the student with respect to the bus is equal to 2 meters per second. And we're asked for the speed of the student with respect to the earth. Well, follow the rules we did before. That's going to be speed of the student and then sub subscript plus speed of that same subscript, earth, right, student, the first one, earth, the last one, and then I need intermediate to be the same. So clearly the only thing I have to relate these is the bus. So there's my equation for the speed of the student with respect to the earth. And then I just put in my number, so the speed of the student with respect to the bus is 2 meters per second, plus the speed of the bus with respect to the earth, 20 meters per second, and I get exactly 22 meters per second. Bueno, right? That, that wasn't pushing. So let's go a step further. A spaceship is traveling at 0 0.80 C relative to the Earth. So here's my spaceship. C is the symbol for the speed of light. So that means that the spaceship is traveling at 80% of the speed of light relative to the Earth. And it fires a torpedo. So here's the torpedo. And the speed of the torpedo with respect to the spacecraft or spaceship 
is 0 0.40 C. And we have the question, how fast is the torpedo traveling relative to the Earth? Well, if I just do the same thing I've done before, space of the torpedo with respect to the Earth is space speed of the torpedo with respect to something, plus the speed of that same something with respect to the Earth. The only thing I have here is the spacecraft. And so if I put in the numbers, 0 0.40 C plus 0 0.80 C equals 1.2 C, right? Wrong. Wrong. How could that be wrong? It was perfectly right. I contended here for the person on the bus, and now I say it's wrong here? Well, here's the thing. Experiment after experiment has said that nothing can exceed the speed of light. That is, C is the ultimate speed. It doesn't matter what reference frame you're in, you're never going to see something travel faster than the speed of light. So it's got to be slower than 1.2 because we would be violating this rule. That's where we start to get tricky with relativity. Suddenly, things break down that were obvious. So how do we deal with this? Well, first, James Clerk Maxwell, when he came up with his electromagnetic waves, he determined that the speed of light in vacuum is 1 over the square root of the permeability of free space times the permittivity of free space, which using the values of those that we know today is 299792458 meters per second, which, which is right here. So we have a fixed speed of light and nothing can exceed that as far as we can tell. In light in vacuum, in any reference frame, any inertial reference frame, you're always going to find that speed. It doesn't matter. <sighs> here is a question. I kid you not, when I was in graduate school, I went to a comedy club, some random person I'd never met before, and I, for some reason, started talking about this. We got into a very heated exchange, and the comedian had to tell us to shut up because we were disrupting his, his show. So this is an idea that Einstein had. Einstein would ride the train to work and think about these crazy things. He's like, okay, so let's say we have a car, and this car is traveling at the speed of the car with respect to the ground equals the speed of light. And he says, and now what if that car turns on its headlights? We know the speed of light with respect to the car, by definition, has to be the speed of light. But we also know that the speed of light with respect to the ground, by definition, has to be the speed of light. So what gives? And, you know, Einstein was trying to figure out, well, what gives? Well, let's imagine that the speed of light with respect to the ground is what really is correct. If that were the case, then the light would be stationary with respect to the, to the race car. So the race car driver, instead of seeing electromagnetic waves traveling, he would see frozen electric fields and frozen magnetic fields. That's not an electromagnetic wave. He wouldn't see light. But on the other hand, if the you know if if he's correct that the light's traveling at the speed of light, then the person on Earth would have to say, oh well, that light's traveling at twice the speed of light, which which doesn't work. Which you can see that's why it would bring such a, a heated conversation. So here are the actual, the first two postulates, the two postulates of special relativity, the first two postulates of relativity. So the first one, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. So everything that we have learned is correct if you're in an inertial reference frame. If you're an accelerating reference frame, yeah, some maybe, some maybe not. The second one, the speed of light in vacuum is the same in all inertial reference frames, regardless of the motion of the source or the observer. Those two postulates are what we base our relativity calculations and understanding on. So Einstein is the one who sat down and really figured out what's going on. And I have to emphasize your intuition about physics is based on your experience with things that are going at moderate speeds and your intuition is going to be wrong 
if you talk about things that are traveling at speeds near the speed of light. Um, the, this, the theory that Einstein is, has proposed has been tested in numerous, numerous ways, and it, it always tests true. So we believe it to be true because it gives correct results. So here's Einstein's theory. Now, he published his special relativity theory in 1905. He published three papers in 1905. Those three papers covered what we call the photoelectric effect, which says that light behaves as a particle. Remember, my last lecture was all about why light is a wave. He also had his explanation of Brownian motion. The Brownian motion, the motion, the observed motion of a pollen grain when it was floating in water and jiggle around was simply the result of the motion of molecules of water bouncing off of that pollen. And then finally, his theory on special relativity. Now, in this class, we will only look at special relativity. Special relativity is special because it is only dealing with inertial reference frames. That's what makes it special. When I was your age, I thought special meant that it was the hard part. No, it makes it the easy part. The general relativity is the hard part. That's when you're dealing with non-inertial reference frames and gravity. So like I said, for now, we'll just deal with this special relativity. By the way, which of these do you think Einstein got a Nobel Prize for? He only got a Nobel Prize for one of those three. Answer is the first one I listed. He was awarded partial Nobel Prize for photoelectric effect. Him, yeah, I think it's partial. So another thing that we need to be aware of now, we're stepping out into a new realm, the realm of high speeds. And physicists came up with this thing we call the correspondence principle that says that if we come up with a new theory that works in some special case, it had also better agree with the results of classical physics in the classical realm. That is, the classical physics has been so steady. Classical physics is everything you've learned up to now. That's been so steady. If we come up with some new bizarre theory that works in a special case, if we apply that theory into the classical realm, we'd better get the same results as the classical physics gives us, or we have a problem with our new theory. And so in this case, what's special about relativity is the high speed. So if you slow down and you use those relativity equations, they better give you the same results as you had with classical equations. So let's just get down to it. The positive of the speed of light is the same in all inertial reference frames it leads to a really startling conclusion that what is simultaneous in one reference frame is not necessarily simultaneous in another reference frame. And I'm going to give you the example of when I first realized that there were some issues with simultaneity. Now, this has nothing to do with relativity, but it, it has to do with the idea. So back when I was a young kid, I was like, I don't know, seven years old, my Cousins who lived out in Texas came out to visit my grandparents in California. And so I was there at grandma's house and my older cousin, Robbie, was shooting my grandma's 22. And from a distance, I saw him shooting and I saw him flinch. And then like a second later, I heard the gun report. And I kind of chuckled to myself and I was like, Robbie's afraid of the gun. You know, I thought he was flinching and then pulling the trigger. But as I got closer, the time lapse between when he pulled the trigger and when the report sounded became smaller and smaller. Until when I was right next to him, it the report came at the same time he pulled the trigger. And I was like, uh, there's something funny going on around here. And, and what I didn't understand was that sound is not instantaneous. Sound travels at a speed of about 340 meters per second, whereas light travels at a speed of about 300 million meters per second. So the light travels so much faster than the sound that I had a, a mismatch between my observation with sound and my observation with vision about when it occurred. 
Now, classical physics can correct for this. So that's not what we're talking about when we talk about this conclusion that what's simultaneous in one reference frame is not another. When we talk about these relativity things, it's actual real. That is, they're really not simultaneous in one reference frame, but they are simultaneous in another. And so it's, it's just hard to wrap your mind around. That's one of those things you kind of have to accept. Wow, things are out there. Now, before I get into Einstein's first problem, we do need to recognize that when we're dealing with, with things that occur, with events, events, events aren't just at locations. They're not at, just at a time. They are at a specific three-dimensional location plus the time. So this is a four-dimensional space. And we call this space-time because the fourth dimension is time. Now, oftentimes, we will make our dimensions x, y, z, and ct, so they all have dimensions of length. And so this defines a four-dimensional calculation. And if you shift Y, you're going to have to shift T. If you shift X, you're going to have to shift T because of this four-dimensional thing. Now, to explain what we call time dilation, funniness that happens with time, Einstein came up with a time clock. And his time clock is illustrated here. You have a little light source. And it, it flashes on and sends light out. So that light goes out of here, comes up and hits a mirror, and reflects back down to a detector. And so it doesn't show the detector here in this picture. And so if I want to calculate the time for a tick, one tick is the light going from the bulb to the mirror and back, I would say delta T is equal to, and this is, inside the car. So I'm going to put C for inside the train car. So the delta T, the time measured inside the train car, is going to be equal to, remember, very simple equation, distance is equal to speed multiplied by time. So time is equal to distance over speed. So that's going to be the distance it traveled. Well, if it goes from here up to the mirror and back, it had to travel a distance of 2D. And then time is distance divided by speed. So divide by the speed of light. And the time for one tick, as measured in the train car, is 2D over C. But what if there's somebody on Earth watching this train travel by at a speed V? In that case, the light that comes to the detector, remember when we talked about light, we said light is going in all directions from this bulb. But the light that gets to the detector has to be the light that's going forward like this, hits the mirror when the mirror has moved forward, and then comes back here and gets to the detector. Well, that's clearly a much larger distance. What is the distance the light travels? Well, this distance of the purple line is going to be equal to the speed of the train multiplied by one half. Okay, that color is not showing up very well. So this distance here is speed oh, like that, speed of the train, so I put V for the speed of the train and C for speed of light, multiplied by the time measured by the train divided by 2, because that's only half a tick to get there. And then we have this here is, again, V delta T train over 2 for the second half. So what's the total distance that's traveled? Well, just using the Pythagorean theorem, this here has the length of square root of d squared plus v delta t train over 2 squared. And we have two of them. And so we have delta t train is equal to 2 times the distance. And the distance is two of those. All divided by the speed of light. Now you look at this 
and it all seems fine and dandy, but notice that I have delta t in there twice. I have delta t on the left-hand side and delta t in that square root. So first I'm going to simplify this, then I'm going to solve for delta t. So delta t train, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 square root of d squared plus v delta t train over 2 squared all over c. I'm going to move that c into the square root. I'm actually going to move the 4 into the square root as well. Um, Why well, I didn't do that math right, did I? I wanted to make my life easy. But let's leave the 4 out for now, just so I don't mess up any math. So I just moved the C up into my square root. Obvious thing to do here is to square both sides. Delta T, T, quantity squared equals 16 D over C quantity squared plus 16 V delta T over T C quantity squared. Well, I have delta T, delta T there, and delta T there. And I have a D over C here. Now, the D over C, that is actually related to what we had before. We had delta TC was 2 D over C. So if I make this 4 times 2 D over C squared, 2 times 2 is 4 times 4 is 16. That's the same thing. And then I have 16 over 2 squared, 16 over 4. That's 4 There I've rearranged, and I can rewrite this as 4 delta t for the car squared. I'll just put it like, like this so we're not confused about what's being squared. Plus 4 v delta t. Now remember, I want to solve for delta t. So I'm going to subtract this from both sides. So I will have delta t train squared minus 4 v squared over c squared delta t train squared equals 4 delta t c squared. Factor out. Okay, I made a mistake. Where did I make a mistake? Um, that's that. I multiply by 2 twice. Uh, there shouldn't have been a second 2 there, which means that when I did this, it should have just been 2. That should have been 2. That then becomes 4. That becomes 4. You can see what I was trying to factor. Get rid of those fours. And <laughs> now it's correct. I hate mistakes, but hey, do we make them? Yes, we do. So what I have now is factor out the delta t train squared. 1 minus v squared over c squared equals delta t car squared. Final thing then is to square root both sides. So I have delta t on the train times 
times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared equals delta t for the car. Now you look at that and you're like, wait a minute. The time for the tick of the clock is different depending on if you're measuring it standing on the earth or if you're measuring it sitting inside the train car. That should make no sense. And yet, it's pretty simple geometry, not so simple that I can't make a mistake, but pretty simple geometry that says that that has to be true. And so Einstein said, it is, it is, it's true that time is malleable. That you can have time, different amount of time pass depending on who's measuring. And so we call this process time dilation. Now we have a factor gamma. I didn't define gamma now, did I? You haven't seen it anywhere. Well, gamma is called the Lorentz factor. And if you take this relationship, we usually write it as delta t. Really, did I use car and train? Eh, car and train was a bad idea. Um, Delta T, <laughs> let's redefine these. The train was measured, was supposed to be when you're measuring from the earth. So delta T measured by the earth is equal to delta T measured by the car divided by square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. And then we define, gamma is defined as 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared square rooted. We call it the Lorentz factor. And so notice v is always between 0, well, v squared is always between 0 and c squared. So 1 minus something that could approach 1. If v is approaching c, then gamma approaches infinity. If v is approaching 0, gamma is 1. So gamma is between 1 and infinity. So it's from 1 to infinity, always a positive value, always greater than or equal to 1. And so the time measured by somebody on Earth is always going to be bigger than the time measured by somebody in that train car with the, with the clock. And so that's what we call time dilation. And we have time dilation because the time measured by an observer that's not moving with the clock is always longer. It's dilated. So we can remember this, moving clocks run slow. So if you have a clock that you see is stationary, it'll keep correct time. If you see a clock that is moving, you will say, wow, that clock is running slow. It's not keeping correct time. That's the way it works. We call it time dilation. And this is, this is purely applicable to anything. So if you are in a spacecraft traveling at 0.8 times the speed of light, you measure your heart rate as a normal. You know, if I was traveling 0.8 times speed of light, my heart rate might be 140 beats per, per minute because, you know, I'm going to be a little excited. But if you're standing on Earth and you see me flying by, you would say, well, gamma is 1 over square root of 1 minus 0.80c over c quantity squared. You notice it's very convenient if you list the speed in units of speed of light then those C's cancel. I just have 1 minus 0 0.8 squared. 0 0.8 squared is 0.64. And of course, 1 minus 0 0.64 is 0.36. And the square root of 0 0.36 is 0 0.6. And so 1 over 0 0.6 is, and I actually calculated this just because I didn't want to make a mistake this time around. 1.67, six repeating forever. So the Lorentz factor is 1.67, and so you'd say my heart rate is changing the time between, let, let us say that I said that my heart rate was 120 beats per minute. Why 120? Because that makes it easy. That's equal to two beats per second, right? Therefore, the time between beats measured by me, I'm going to put a subscript zero, is equal to 0 0.5 seconds. It's a half second per beat as measured by me. But since I'm traveling at 
point eight times speed of light, the time between the beats measured for somebody on Earth is going to be 1.67 times 0 0.5 seconds, which is equal to 1.67. I don't know why I'm doing this on the computer, but I am. 0 0.833 seconds per beat which means that the frequency is <laughs> nice work the frequency is one point two beats per second or multiply that by 60 well 6 times 12 is 72 so notice the frequency the heart rates here are frequencies is not what I use in the calculation I shifted to the time between events and then I calculated my time dilation and got my new beat frequency so somebody seeing me fly by would say ah oh, that's a great pedestrian heart rate Richard has 72 beats per minute when in fact my heart's fluttering. So that is an example of how time dilation works. Now we have to have some kind of reference for time. If, if time varies from reference frame to reference frame, what can we use as a reference? Well, the reference we use we call the proper time. Proper does not mean correct. The time measured in any reference frame is a correct measurement. It's correct for that reference frame. So the proper time is a limit. The proper time is the limit for the <clears throat> shortest time between events. So if you're measuring the time between beats of my heart, the proper time is going to be the time measured in the reference frame where that is the shortest possible time. Any other reference frame is going to measure a longer time between heartbeats. So if you look at my example here, you know, I measured 0.5 seconds. That's the proper time, and we designate it with the subscript zero. Somebody on Earth measured 0.833 seconds. That's a dilated time. It's longer. So the proper time is the shortest possible time that can occur between two events. And then we just have our time dilation equation. We saw it before with 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, but it's simpler to write it using gamma, that Lorentz constant, um, or Lorentz factor, not constant. <sighs> Problem-solving strategy. Yes, you're going to do some problems with this. First thing to do is identify what the two events are that mark the beginning and the end of the time interval in question. The clock is whatever measures this time interval. So, I mean, we're not really worried about the clock. We're worried about the time between two events. And then you need to identify the reference frame in which the clock is at rest, where the clock isn't moving. If, the, if we're measuring my heart rate, then the clock would need to be stationary with respect to my heart. So it needs to be whatever my reference frame is. So if I am in an airplane, it'd be whatever reference frame that airplane is. If I am standing on Earth, it'd be on the Earth. Once you have that, Calculate what the time is in that reference frame. And in, any other ref in any other reference frame, then you just use the Lorentz factor and you use our equation, delta t is equal to gamma delta t zero. The mechanics of doing a time dilation problem are actually pretty simple, but the concepts are oh so confusing. Um, by the way, it's not 6, 6, 56 p.m., it's 5.56 p.m. Now, in terms of units, the speeds, we usually write them as a fraction of speed of light, so 0.13c, i.e. 13% speed of light. You could change that to meters per second, but it's going to be a lot harder in your calculations. So leave them like this if you have them, because then you can have Lorentz factors, 1 over square root of 1 minus v over c quantity squared. And if you put in 0.13c,
then those C's cancel, and you just have to do 1 minus 0.13 squared and keep going. Another thing, distances are often measured in light years. A light year is the distance light travels in vacuum in one year. So one light year is equal to the speed of light multiplied by one year. It's a very simple <clears throat> definition. And so just don't put them into meters. Just keep them in, in light years and then get times in years. So calculations involving light years are simplified by writing the speed of light since we have one light year is equal to C times one year, then C is equal to one light year divided by one year. And so you can put that in for C and, and convert units. Okay, a good question. A sprinter runs a 100 meter race, and let's just assume it's a straight line race, not one that's going around a track. Who measures the proper time for this race? You have the option of the sprinter, the official timekeeper who is stationary on Earth, neither or both. Remember our how we determine the proper time. We need stationary clock with the two events. So what that means is the two events occur at the same location as the clock and there's no motion. So in what reference frame are the two locations the same? In the sprinter's reference frame, this race starts at the sprinter, the race ends at the sprinter. So the sprinter is present at both places. And we are making a grand assumption the sprinter runs at a constant velocity throughout the race. That's obviously kind of an assumption. Um, so it's the sprinter that's going to measure the proper time. The official timekeeper sees the start of the race here and the end of the race here. Those are different locations, but his clock stayed, let's say, right here. So the first event wasn't his clock, the second event wasn't his clock, and the events weren't at the same location. If the events had both been right here and stationary with his clock, then he would have measured the proper time. So the Earth is not right, and of course, neither and both are ruled out by the fact that we have already settled it. Going to a, a thought process that we're going to then solve, an astronaut leaves Earth in a spacecraft moving at 0 0.80 times the speed of light and travels to a star 30 light years away as measured on Earth. Who measures the proper time for this trip? Well, just using what we had up here, Stationary clock with two events is going to measure the proper time. So who is present at the start and end of this trip? The astronaut. And the astronaut sees himself or herself as stationary. Hence, the astronaut's going to measure the proper time. Now, what is that proper time? Well, let's start with delta T is equal to distance over speed, right? So we have the distance measured by Earth is equal to 30.0 light years. And the speed measured by Earth is equal to 0 0.80 times the speed of light. So I didn't put a subscript E here for the speed because of something kind of cool. If you are traveling away from me at half the speed of light, then you would see me as traveling at exactly that same speed in the opposite direction. So the speed is going to be the same for both the astronaut and the observer on Earth. The only difference is the astronaut says that the Earth is traveling to my left at point C, whereas the person on Earth says the astronaut is traveling to my right at speed of point C. So the time that passes on Earth is going to be equal to 30.0 light years divided by 0 0.80 C. But remember, 30.0 light years is 30.0 speed of light multiplied by one year divided by 0 0.80 speed of light. Speed of lights cancel. And I just have 30 over 0.8 in years. 
So 30 over 0.8 in years is 37.5 years. So the person on Earth says it takes 37 and a half years for the spacecraft to do this trip. <clears throat> but we established that the astronauts are the one that measures the proper time. So we know delta T measured on Earth is equal to gamma delta T ot. So delta T ot, the speed of, or the time that the astronaut sees for this trip is equal to delta T Earth divided by gamma. Well, we need to calculate gamma. I already calculated gamma before now, didn't I? Gamma was one over square root of one minus 0 0.80 C over C quantity squared. And remember I went through the C's cancel, 0.8 squared is 0.64, one minus 0.64 is 0.36. Square root of 0.36 is 0.6, one over 0.6 is equal to 1.6 repeating. I'll give myself a few more digits here this time and put the repeating. So the time measured on Earth is equal to, thir or by the astronauts, 37.5 years divided by 1.666 repeating, or you could say 37.5 times 0.6. That gives us the astounding, astonishing answer that the proper time for this trip is 22.5 years. Now, if we think about this for just a second, we're like, whoa, two different times for the exact same trip. The person on Earth says it takes 37 and a half years to travel a distance that it takes like 30 years. That makes perfect sense. It, going slower than the speed of light, as you must do, it's going to take them longer than 30 years. But the astronaut says it was only 22 and a half years to cover the distance that light covers in 30 years. That suggests superluminal speed. That is faster than the speed of light, right? But nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So what has to give? Now I'll leave that to answer in just a couple minutes. <clears throat> What's the difference in this question and the preceding one? Travels to a star three light years away and back. Well, now we have to think about things a little more carefully because we have, here's the starting point, here's the intermediate point, and then the ending point. So we're going like this. And we have all clocks are here at the start and the end. So one might say, ah, well, they're both going to measure the proper time because the clock is at the same location at both starting and ending. But the clock needs to be with <laughs> needs to be stationary and it needs to be with whatever it's measuring so it, it turns out that through convoluted thinking the astronauts still measuring the proper time for this round trip but i have to get you through to that and this brings up the twin paradox the twin paradox is a 20-year-old astronaut, Ashton, leaves Earth in a spacecraft, spacecraft moving at point AOC. How old is Ashton when he returns from a trip to a star 30 light years from Earth, assuming that he moves at point AOC relative to Earth during the entire trip? We can answer this by the work we've already done. From the work we've already done, it takes him 22 and a half years out and, of course, 22 and a half years back. So we're going to have age measured by Ashton is equal to 22.5 years plus 22.5 years equals 45 years. Plus, that's how much he's aged. That's delta age. So his true age is going to be that 45 years plus he started at 20 years, so it's going to be 65 years of age. Ashton, 65 years of age. Now, Ashton, I should point out, it could be a man or a woman. I had a student a couple years ago. Ashton is a woman. She married a man whose name was Ashton and was a man. Very confusing family. Now, we've established how old Ashton is when he gets back. What about somebody who stayed on Earth for the entire time? Somebody who stayed on Earth for the entire time would have delta age 
on Earth is equal to what we say 37 and a half years. And so that's 75 years is how much the person on Earth is aged. So if Ashton had a twin that's name was B, because that's what the textbook uses, so I'd have age of B would be 75 plus 20, 95 years. So Ashton and B, twins, are now 20 years different in age, 30 years different in age. Does that make sense? That's what the physics says. Now, back to my question here about who measures the proper time. Remember when we started out, we said that we're doing special relativity. Special. Special means inertial reference frames. So my calculations are only true for special or for inertial reference frames. So the whole time dilation thing, it depends on your reference frame who's going to be correct. The person on Earth, they're going to say, oh, look, Ashton's heart is really a long time between beats. Is that correct? Yes, because the person on Earth is in an inertial reference frame. Ashton in the spacecraft is going to say, oh, look, that person on Earth, the time between their heartbeats is a really long time. Time is passing more slowly for them. Is that correct? Not at the beginning of the trip when they're accelerating to speed up. Not when they're slowing down, changing directions, coming back. Not when it ends. So, in fact, what, you're, what you would have with the calculations is if you were plotting the elapsed time as a function of distance. So here's time and here's distance. The person on Earth sees it going like that, straight line. The person in the spacecraft, that's the person on Earth looking at the person in the spacecraft. The person in the spacecraft sees a big jump, then a, and then big jump. And so you have, during the accelerating periods, this special relativity doesn't apply, and that's where things break down. Our last, actually, it's our next last topic for today, length contraction. We talked about the person, Ashton, making this trip that takes like 30 years and only takes Ashton 22 and a half years. How can that be possible? The answer is the distance that Ashton travels is different than the distance measured on Earth. Now, what does Ashton mean when we say the distance Ashton travels? Ashton, of course, sees him or herself in this rocket and stationary. But Ashton started with the Earth here and their destination out here. And then as time passed, the Earth and the destination moved until Ashton was at the destination. So Ashton measures the length for the trip as the separation between Earth and the destination, just like the person on Earth measured the distance as the difference between the Earth and the destination. And now we have to ask, hmm, who's right? Well, as you might have guessed, they're both right. Just like they're both right with the time, they're both right with the distance. But Ashton is going to measure a shorter distance. In fact, we can calculate that from what we've already done. We have delta time for Ashton is equal to 22.5 years. And the speed for Ashton is 0 0.80c. Put those together. And the length measured by Ashton is equal to delta T Ashton times V Ashton. By the way, Ashton's my grandson's name, hence why I think of it as a male. And so that's going to be 22.5 years times 0 0.80C. Well, 22 times 0.8, 22.5 times 0.8 is equal to 18 light years. So Ashton sees the separation between the Earth and the destination is only 18 light years apart. And so it makes sense that Ashton traveling at 0.8c can travel it in 22 and a half years. So we have this thing we call length contraction. Now, if we put our numbers in, length is equal to delta t times v 
and delta t was delta t zero over gamma. And so putting these together, we can say, aha, the length That is the other length, so I'm going to put L prime over gamma. L prime, well, actually, let me leave it like that, because that's actually the way we do it. So the length is equal to L prime over gamma, and then we have to define a proper length. What is a proper length? Well, you saw that with Ashton, the distance was shorter. And if Ashton was going faster, gamma would have been a bigger number. It would have taken less time, and the distance would have been even shorter. So the length is getting smaller, hence the word contraction. Length contraction because distances get smaller when an object is moving than they are when it's stationary. So the proper length is going to be the length that's the maximum value. And so putting this in, this L prime was the proper length. Oh, I thought it was in there was the proper length. So the length in any reference frame is the proper length divided by gamma, where the proper length is the longest possible distance that can be between two points. So, yep, there's our equation. L is equal to L out over gamma. And we just got that from using our time dilation equation and the definition of speed versus distance traveled. So the proper length, also known as the rest length, the proper length is the length something measures when it's at rest. So if you have a meter stick and you hold it in your hand, it's stationary with respect to you, you're going to measure its proper length. If you're traveling at half the speed of light past somebody and they look at that meter stick and they have some miraculous technology that allows them to measure the length of that meter stick accurately, they're going to measure a shorter meter stick. So that's what length contraction is. And there is a very important statement at the bottom of this slide. Lengths perpendicular to the motion are not contracted. Length contraction is only parallel to velocity. So I like to say, you know, here I am. I'm not a skinny man. If I'm traveling like this with respect to you, you are going to see me flattened out. because of length contraction. So I'm going to look skinnier. That's excellent. But if I lay down in bed, and I'm traveling like this, you're going to see me not so excellent makes me shorter and, well, the same size belly, which looks like I'm fatter. So it's only in the direction parallel to motion that you have length contraction. So how do we solve length contraction problems? First, identify the objects that's going to have its length changing. And for length contraction, it's only in the direction of objects motion, so you ignore other directions. If it's a distance rather than a length, like you know, my example with the distance between the earth and the destination, pretend that you have an actual rod that connects the two and it's the length of that rod that connects the two. Then you need to identify the reference frame in which the object is at rest. You know, that rod that's connecting to the two, that's your proper length reference frame. And then any other reference frame is going to be a contracted length. So, Back to our problem, an astronaut leaves Earth in a spacecraft moving at 0.80c and travels to a star 30 light years away and back. This is 30 light years away as measured by Earth. Who measures the proper distance for this trip? So I have Earth and I have my destination. I treat this as if there is a solid bar between them. And my question is, which reference frame sees this bar stationary? Is it the person here on Earth? Or is it the person that's traveling from A to B? Well, the person traveling from A to B sees the, the rod moving to the left in my picture. So the person that's traveling 
does not see it stationary. The person on Earth sees it stationary, so they're going to measure the proper length. So Earth measures proper length for Ashton's trip. Ashton's trip. Ashton measures proper time for the trip. Now, here is an example, one of many that have been used to test relativity. So cosmic rays are energetic particles, mostly protons, that enter the Earth's upper atmosphere from space. Cosmic rays come from space. Um, solar wind comes from the sun. Both of them come into the Earth's atmosphere. The particles collide with the atmosphere molecules in the upper atmosphere and produce a shower of particles. One of the particles produces a nuance, a subatomic, well, it's part of particle physics, which is something like a heavy electron. A muon has a, the same charge as an electron. It's a lepton. It has the same behavior as a lepton, but it has more mass. But it's unstable. It will decay. And half of all muons will decay in 1.5 microseconds. So, practical problem. In a shower of muons streaming toward the Earth's surface, some decay before reaching the ground. If 1 million muons are moving toward the ground at 0.995 C at an altitude of 4,500 meters above sea level, how many survive to reach sea level? Well, how long is it going to take for them to reach the ground? Delta T, as measured on Earth, is equal to the length is measured on Earth divided by the speed. That's a V. So that's going to be 4,500 meters divided by 0 0.995 C. And so, as luck would have it, I didn't actually do this calculation in preparation. But um, 450 divided by, well, Let's just do the calculation. Equals two nine seven nine two four five eight. So in this case, I actually have to calculate the speed in meters per second, and that speed in meters per second. is two nine eight two nine three four okay nine six meters per second and so if i just do that calculation to determine the time is that, 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 that and i have 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds, which is equal to 15 microseconds. Now remember, we have one half exists 1.5 microseconds later. This is 15 microseconds. So that means I should have one half this is 10 times the half-life, so raised to the 10. And that would be equal to um, roughly, well, it's, this is exactly it. I should have one 1,024th that remain. If there was no such thing as time dilation or length contraction, because the... The half-life, this time here, that's measured in the muon reference frame. But this time was measured in the Earth reference frame. Well, those aren't the same. We have to use time dilation. Which one's the proper time? Well, the proper time is the one where the clock is stationary, which is going to be the muon is stationary. So the time on Earth is the dilated time, 
is equal to gamma times the muon. That's mu for the muon. And so I can calculate what the time for the muon is based on this time on Earth. Now, what is gamma for 0.995? I always recommend doing gamma right at the outset because you're almost always going to use it. 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.995 squared. Notice it's C over C, but the C's cancel. And so if I calculate the gamma there, I have... Hopefully you're doing this along at home, not just you know leaving me to do this by myself. Gamma is 10.01. Or 10 point, yeah, 01. Which between you and me, good friends, that's 10. And so that means, oops, up here's where I should put it. 15 microseconds over 10. The time this passed for the muon is just 1.5 microseconds or one half-life. So in reality, one half-life means that you have one half remaining. That's a big experimental difference, right? You can, you can definitely make that measurement and determination if the relativity is giving you the right answer or if it's not. And so here's actually doing all the calculations. First of all, I said, well, what about what's the length seen by the muon? The length seen by the by Earth is the proper length because that meter stick is stationary with respect to the Earth, whereas for the muon it's moving. And so I did length contraction here. Um, well, actually, I didn't yet. I did the distance that the um, – I take that back. The distance that the muon travels in one half-life is what I calculated here. And then I actually calculated what the contracted length is. And the contracted length is the proper length over gamma, which is 4,500 meters over 10 is 450 meters. And so I'd say, ah, oh, it travels essentially the distance that it will travel in one half-life to go from the top to the bottom. So we'd have one half life, or I could do it the way I did before. Now, my last thing, truly the last thing for today, is addition of parallel velocities. So here we have Abe and B. B is in her little spaceship, and she shoots a probe. So we have the speed of B with regards to A, and the speed of the probe with regards to A. And the question is, what's the speed of the probe with regards to B? Or, well... I actually did my calculation a little different. If we were to do Galilean relationships, so I'm just going to do the calculations here just so we don't have any confusion. The speed of the probe with respect to B, let's say that's equal to 0.40C, and speed of B with respect to A, let's say speed of B with respect to A, Abe, <laughs> is 0.80C. Just, you know, choosing random numbers. If I were to do this, I would say, okay, speed of the probe with respect to A is speed of the probe with respect to B plus speed of B with respect to A. Remember, those are the same thing. And I would just add the numbers up, and I would have gotten 1.2 C, which simply can't be right. Once again, you can't have something going faster speed of light. Relativistic calculation, and once again, if you want to know the truth, you talk to David Chapman, who's going to have to derive this using calculus says that if we have a relativistic speed, we take the same thing that we had from Galileo, that is our standard, what, we, what makes sense to us, but we have to divide it by one plus the product of the two things on top divided by C squared. So the true answer here is the velocity of the probe with respect to A is equal to the velocity of the probe with respect to B, that's 0.40C, plus Velocity of B with respect to A, that's 0.80C, divided by 1 plus the same two numbers that were on top over C squared. Now let's notice here, actually I'm going to use the 
my C's, all of my C's cancel. This C cancel with one C, this C cancel with the other. And so I am left with 1.20C over 1 plus 4 times A is 32, 0.32, 1.20C over 1.32, which is in, let's just do calculation, 1.2 divided by 1.32 is 0 0.9090 repeating C. So look, the speed of the probe with respect to Abe stays below the speed of light. What if instead of shooting a probe, she shot out a photon torpedo? Photon torpedo means it's light, which travels at the speed of light. So what if VPB had been C? Well, if VPB had been C, it's dangerous to change numbers, I won't. It would be C plus 0 0.80C over 1 plus C times 0.80C all over C squared. That would be equal to 1.80C divided by 1.80C equals C. So they would both measure the photon torpedoes traveling at the speed of light. This goes back to the problem with the car that I had the argument with at the comedy club. This calculation says, uh -huh, the light will travel at the speed of light in both reference frames. Bueno. So this is just going through the work we just did. Problem solving strategies for relative motion, for speed addition. Sketch the situation. It's always important to get that sketch. Make sure your subscripts make sense. You want the speed of object with respect to reference frame. So speed of object reference frame is the way those go. Um, then remember that velocity transformation formula. And here's something really important that I only mentioned once. If you need to reverse it, like if I want to find the speed of A with respect to the probe, that'd be speed of A with respect to B plus speed of B with respect to the probe divided by one plus speed of A with respect to B, speed with respect to the probe over C squared. But looking at the variables I have, I have PB, BA, PB and BA, BP, AB. Well, what I need to do then is I need to say VAB equals minus VBA and VBP equals minus VPB. And then I put those in and I can calculate it. That, that is it except for a problem. So let's do a problem and I'll go home. Two spaceships travel at high speed in the same direction along a straight line. As measured by an observer on a nearby planet, ship one is behind ship two. So, <coughs> excuse me, draw a picture. Here's ship one. Here's ship two. Um, ship one, speed of one with respect to the observer, whoever that is. So I'll just put O, is equal to 0 0.90C. That was not supposed to do that. And the speed of ship two with respect to the same observer is 0 0.70 C. Now the question is, according to an observer on board ship one, how fast in, in what direction is ship two moving? So I want to find the speed of ship two with respect to ship one. So you have to take these words and interpret what, you know, what's the object and what is the reference. So it's object reference there. And then using our equation, that's going to be 2 blank plus V blank 1, 1 plus V2 blank V blank 1 over C squared. Now I need to fill in the blank. So what's the other variable I have here? Well, it's clearly the observer. 
And so V2 observer, I know that. 0 0.70 C plus, and then V observer with respect to one, I know V1 observer. So V observer one is equal to minus V1 observer equals minus 0 0.90 C. So 0.7 minus 0.9 is minus 0.20 C on top. On bottom, I have 1 minus, or well, 1 plus, and then 0.7 times 0.9 is 0.63. With my sign, it's minus 0 0.63. And notice my C's cancel. And so that's equal to my 0 0.20 C divided by 1 minus 0 0.63. And so if I did my math right, minus 0 0.541 C. So that's how we do velocity addition. Notice here I had to do this conversion from one, you know, A to B to B to A. And then I just plug them into that equation. So you should be ready to do some velocity addition problems, some time dilation problems, and some length contraction problems. Have a happy Sabbath.